The question of human security, as I was saying uh, before, is not just a formula. It's something very practical. It's something that should be even more practical. In fact, we are going to look into how to make human security possible, how to make people safe. This is what is human security all about. This term was used for the first time in political settings by the former uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, Boutros Boutros Ghali, in 92. And then that was echoed in an ensuing report by the United Nations Development Program and became part of the jargon, became part of the jargon in humanitarian uh, settings, in political settings, in peace building settings. In fact, we can very well say that the full agenda of uh, peace building uh, emanates from the concept of uh, human security. So human security means primarily freedom from fear, freedom from want. It means caring for people, making people safer you know, by all means, uh, uh, addressing the needs of people, the societal aspirations of people, basic needs, equality, opportunities. So because of that, we need to understand not just the concept, as I said, but the practices. What are the concrete practices that make human security possible? We are extremely fortunate, as I said, to have three leaders in their respective fields that can tell us about this experience. And I am particularly uh, touched uh, somehow to, to have Murira among ourselves. Munira, I met Munira only a month ago in Geneva at uh, an important conference, the International Leadership Association Conference. And both myself, Alberto Zucconi, and also Rama Mani, who was with us, uh, we immediately uh, tied up with her. Uh, I'll tell you why. First of all, because you see her, uh, she, uh, she is a powerful individual who uh, speaks with her heart and mind. Uh, but also because she found herself uh, in a predicament that unfortunately uh, many other people uh, fell into in her country, that is Afghanistan. Uh, she has been evicted from her country, but before being evicted uh, and becoming a refugee, as you are right now, Monira, I understand, you were the former deputy minister of defense of your country. Uh, with a specific responsibility over education for the Ministry of Defense personnel. Besides that, you are an artist and a poet. And, and here I have initially a question for you. How can you reconcile being an artist, a poet, and a lady in uniform? Uh, because that needs to be uh, in dealing with, with defense issues. Uh, so keep that question in mind. But I also want to complete your presentation saying that Munira was the first woman to become the spokesperson for an important government institution in her country. And keep it uh, with, uh, with yourself in terms of her own background. Uh, she was extremely humble at the beginning of her experience, and she even worked in weaving carpets in a, in a carpet shop. But she also taught Afghani immigrants uh, who were not to study, were not allowed to study in, in her own camp, but they studied in, a, in, in Iran. Uh, and then she established a school for Afghani refugee girls, which was later on recognized even by the Iranian uh, government. So with, with, uh, with, uh, with said, I just said, who I think you are, Monira, uh, in, in terms of your achievements. Uh, you, you have everybody who wants to read about her curriculum can do that because we made it available. But now, Monira, the question is really, first of all, how can you reconcile to the, the issue of being a poet, poet and artist and being uh, and wearing uniforms, at least in, in part of your career? And then second, what is human security for you? Uh, tell us, uh, with your heart and mind, with your soul, uh, what do you think that means? Uh, how that can be transformed in something different for people, especially in a country like Afghanistan that has been betrayed, that has been left alone, uh, in a dramatic situation, especially women, children, uh, elderly people, 
with the famine looming. We you know that over 28 million people this winter will be starving. So what does it mean, Monira, I repeat, to be dealing with human security in a country such as Afghanistan? Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear Donato. Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished high official president at this conference, professors, experts, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizer of this important and, uh, in, uh, and a valuable conference. Uh, second, I'm grateful uh, for inviting me to this distinguished conference. Uh, I hope uh, that my words, which are the facts and history uh, of the past 20 years uh, progress of education in Afghanistan and, and its uh, future after August 15th uh, this year uh, will be a window to continue to support Afghans who are suffering, uh, to, um, suffering from economic poverty. Uh, still, they are uh, uh, hoping for an Afghanistan free uh, extremism and illiteracy. Uh, today, I want to talk about the education in country that with the, uh, with the help of international community has embarked 20 years uh, of development and support and uh, that despite facing numerous social, security, economic and political uh, challenge, education was forward looking and promising. On behalf of young uh, generation and on behalf of women in Afghanistan, I would like to thank all the countries for their 20 years of support. And I want um, to say that the people of Afghanistan will never forget this generosity. Um, the last 20 years are like um, golden history will be remembered in elementary education, higher education, human rights and support uh, women and youth. Uh, in uh, the last two decades, the significant presence of girls, um, um, as girls in primary and higher education and institutions as, uh, and young um, people as teachers and principals in the fields had, um, felt had been efficient and communicable. For the past 20 years, uh, even thought the fight against terrorism has been the, has been at the forefront of politics and the news, but uh, electricity has uh, been seen as a factor in fueling war or um, uh, fueling war and extremism in Afghanistan. That's uh, why therefore it has been decided to open and the gates of public and private schools and university uh, to everyone. The establishment of schools with basic facilities, uh, the existence of unified system, the monitoring of the educational process by international educational institution and the will uh, of the people for education in a country that went through 40 years of war was a message for a better tomorrow. Report from reportable international organization showed that despite the efforts of the international community and the Afghan cultural generation uh, to strengthen Afghanistan's education system due to widespread uh, uh, corruption, a false culture was left uh, over from the war and growing activity of, um, of extremists and terrorists as expected, and Afghanistan desperately needed it. Afghanistan's education did not achieve the desired results. The historical shame of the ghost school, the ghost teacher, the ghost student had a clear message uh, that unfortunately some Afghan politicians uh, preferred their interest uh, to the future of this country and made a bad history on Afghanistan that remind a disgrace. Undoubtedly, one of the reasons for the continuation of the war in Afghanistan and the lack of social peace uh, and uh, can be the lack of a standard education and inadequate education. 
Uh, I must point out that where there is no standard education, appropriate education takes its place. Hence, due to incorrect education, the rule-based system of government gives why to the group-based and divisive system of government and such a society is doomed. The temporary rising of the uh, Taliban and ISIS flags at the Kabul University, at the Nengarhar University, the writing slogans supporting the, the Taliban by, um, by university students and the presence of extremist ideas among teachers and even school students were sign of inadequate and quality education in Afghanistan. At this point, I want to talk about a country that they had problem of lack of standard and insufficient education. Improper education began as a child in mosques or madrasas not controlled by government or was outside of, of Afghanistan. These students were used as a soldier to promote inhuman ideologies that danger national peace, social peace, and local development. The notion of that education is just the open, opening of schools, building, and a few structures was common misconceptions of the Afghan people. Although the opening of the school gates can be helpful, the educational content gives the message that, unfortunately, the people with Afghan culture and knowledge were less involved in educational reform and in some cases were not even allowed to enter. As a result, the content of the educational materials was sometimes anti-gender equality and contrary international standard, uh, standards. Unfortunately, Latterly, Afghanistan education system had moved toward politicizations and ethnicization, and it was not a transformational system in which teaching and learning should be a national responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, despite this challenge, many boys and girls had access to the to education and the same times the supervisory role of the international community in addition to financial aid educational and institutions sought to take steps to standardize educational institutions although the steps of standardization and reform were slow but they were promising. But today, it's very difficult for me to say now that on August 15th, four months ago, we once again witnessed painful devastation in our country, resulting from incorrect peace negotiations and the treason of some politicians in our country. The political collapse of Afghanistan the destruction, destruction of the young democratic system in the hands of the extremists whose crimes the world aware, is aware of turned Afghanistan into a negative transformation and carried public, public, uh, public despair. And suddenly the Afghan education system faced difficult question. Which choice is better? Closing down our schools or opening schools under the leadership of the extremism Taliban. Which is more destructive? Lack of an education system or an existence of a flawed education system leading to extremism. For four months now, schools and university has been devastated under the Taliban's extremist ideology and a new policy is being enacted every day. One, separating the place of education of girls from boys. Two, teaching men to men and women to women. 
Three, changing past educational materials and they approve education materials or Islamic materials. Four, hiring teachers according to the criteria. Five, closing girls' school for, for not a specified period of time. Six, making female professors and teachers stay at home. Seven, uncertainty over the fate of a student, especially female student and art student. I have to say to, uh, with saddens that yesterday's situation like a devastating post earthquake change um, uh, compared to today. I am in daily contact with women and men who do not feel free after the domination of the Taliban. Name this situation align in your own homeland. This is very heartbreaking story. But what to do today? What should the world do in the face of this tribal politics fall? The demand for the reopening of schools and the activation, the education system, although changing the situation to some extent in the current situation cannot save achievement, promote social peace and human rights values. The emphasis on reopening schools while good may lead to the activation of the factory for the production of extremist ideas. Imagine please, could the Taliban run education system be anything other than their beliefs and policy? Undoubtedly not. This is point that they need to be take, taken more care of. Why should the Taliban open the gates of schools except to gain global legitimacy and expand its education system through Afghanistan? The spread of the ideas of the Taliban and its terrorist supporters in schools is the transfer from the, the caves called Torobora to the official and numerous stage of schools and university. I call and, on their, and I call on all international organization, organization supporting women, children, human rights, and global education policymakers to strengthen the direct oversight role of Taliban-run educational institutions. The educational materials of this institution should not change, ne change negatively. Undoubtedly, the education system is the humanizing factor of any society. If the training materials are not made mandatory by the international supervisory Comit committees, we will in fact keep the extremist human turning factory open. I hope and I'm sure that this conference and conference like this will lead the world the view that the Taliban will never want anything but to promote extremism. Let us not forget that a more painful story is about happen to happen and, and that is called eyes eyes a black flag that the looks blacker than the taliban does the world want to leave afghanistan alone with the extremist taliban and is is when its plays permanent role in the ideology of the both religious extremists at the last thank you for your attention and I would like to say that the migration of some Afghan elites does not mean salvation. When an extremist education system is active, 
This is the time where not only 35 million Afghans are in danger, but it, the world is in danger of extremism. Thank you.